Hey guys, most of the time you see me at home like this, working on stuff around here, doing my hobbies. But now I think it's time for me to show you what I do for a living. So come on, go to work with me. Oops, sorry, that's my night job. Hey guys, before we get going, I want to make a quick disclosure. I am not a spokesperson for my airline, nor am I speaking on behalf of I'm just an employee. I want to take you to work, show you what I do for a living, and I don't mean with this video any harm to come to my company in any way, shape, nor form. So, let's get going. If anybody wants a job for life, just become a construction worker at an airport. You'll never be out of work. Construction, construction, construction. About to cross a taxiway here. And this taxiway is where the maintenance taxi hangar is. So here's a taxiway I'm crossing. You see there's an airplane over here. bus down there on its way. I'll get on that and head on over to the terminal. I get off the bus and go into flight operations, meet the co-pilot, and go over the flight plan. And now that the paperwork is completed, it's time to head on out to the jet. It's a little, um, if you get lost at O'Hare, one of the things you can tell people is to meet you at the dinosaur, and that's between the B and C concourses. And this is a pretty rare sight when it's not crazy crowded here at O'Hare. So, starting at the front, going to the back. First class is right here. There's 12 seats. And then there's Economy Plus right here. And all that is is a difference in the pitch between the seats. So, that little gap there is a little bit more in Economy Plus. And this is Economy. I think 150 is the total amount of seats on here. So 150 seats, and there's my office up front, best seat in the house. This is the galley where the chow is, the oven, coffee maker, it's a must, and oh yeah, that's my office with the lab right there, and that's the flight attendant's jump seats. So that's it. Okay, I've already done the real walk around, I'll show you what a walk around is. Now the walk around here can be done by either pilot, but as captain I always designate the co-pilot to do it. But anyway, we start off here at the nose gear and then we look at uh, the probes. There's probes on both sides. Make sure they're there, not damaged. Um, the general condition of the aircraft. And there's a specific sequence that we look at these things just so we could do it the same way every time and not miss anything. But big picture, we're looking at general condition. We're looking at uh, no fluids leaking, no flat tires, uh, damage of any sort is what we're looking for on these walk-arounds. And we're looking at the engine. We're going to make sure that all the blades are in place, not dinged up. There's no trash in the engine. The spinner's nice. The probes that are in there, we make sure that those are nice as well and that's one of the probes and general condition of it make sure the panels are all shut and then as we look at the back or same thing we're looking for damage to the blades you can see there that's the core of the engine and that's the bypass section that's the high bypass section where the air goes around the core and um, I'll explain that later and we're looking again at the in the wheel wells making sure there's no hydraulic fluid leaking the tires the brake wear indicators and we do this on both sides of the aircraft. I'm just going to show you the one side. Now on the inside of the aircraft, we call the setting up the switches a flow. And there's a flow, uh, a sequence in which we start these uh, systems and switches. We're starting things, we're testing things, and we do that in a sequence that flows. And that's why we call it a flow. And here I'm just testing the state of the batteries and then I'm going to do the fire test on the, both engines, the APU, and our cargo fire system. I'm going to give them all a quick test. Okay. 
have to make sure my oxygen mask is working and that my windows closed but just to show you yep it does open but my check is to check to make sure it is closed if there's a failure in the side stick it'll show up right Priority here left. and now I want to just come and check all the rest of the center console items make sure that they're set brake set PA works throttles are at idle now it's time to start the APU the APU is an auxiliary power unit and it's a small jet engine in the back of the airplane that's internal and it runs air and electric for the aircraft systems. Take the flight plan for my iPad and insure it into our flight management and guidance computer. Okay, I'm going to show you how to fly this thing. Rest and uh, you can make it go up or down and all that. Mine's real easy. I just set it on A1. And I set my rudder pedals on eight, and that puts me at the perfect, uh, perfect height. Well, these are our rudder pedals down here, and that operates the uh, rudder back there on the tail. This is a stick, and this is kind of one of those neat ones where the rudder is incorporated into the stick here. It's a side stick. You can see it's on the side. Uh, if I want to turn right, left, this goes up push up and goes down and it coordinates not only the ailerons and spoilers but it also incorporates the rudder into it so on some of you guys that know how to fly a little light airplanes you know you try to coordinate when you turn right you push the right rudder well you don't have to do that it's all incorporated into here it's really neat it's self trimming uh, I'll explain that later but uh, you don't have to trim this airplane it, it trims itself and uh, basically what it's trimming for is 1G wings level are right here uh, pushing forward is fast pulling back is slow and this is how we get it into reverse we lift up these levers and we'll pull this back into the reverse section right here which is bringing the throttles back and we also see it up in here going to reverse and that reverses about 80 percent of the thrust and starts sending it forward it does not change the rotation of the engines okay so uh, when I sit down, the first thing I want to do is come up in here and see these balls. I want to line my head up to where the orange one covers that white one. And that puts me at the perfect seat, seating height to see um, how the airplane is designed. Now this other white one over here is for the co-pilot. When he comes in, he lines it up like that so that you take the orange one and you cover it up with the white one and that's what you're supposed to be seeing. And that, like I said, that puts you at design I height. And uh, we set our altitudes in here. So we're going out of here, we'll go to 3,000 feet. We'll set a heading in here. If they give us a heading, we'll fly the heading out. And um, that's pretty much it. Um, this has the, what we used to call artificial horizon right here. Uh, we call it an attitude indicator. This right here is a multi-function display, so it, it does everything. It's got your airspeed over here, your altitude over here. Um, all right, so here's the fuel sheet. We got 15,200 pounds. Check on 11. It's like this. Right. Okay, 2149. You're going to be sequenced behind a company 73 off the right hand side. And then you go. All right, hotel which is in the airport and there's my airplane I mean I'm literally gonna go through security and then walk right out to the airplane we, uh, this is how we start our 
engine two. There's engine one and engine two. The co-pilot starts them. Our, these are our speed breaker spoilers. Um, and this right here is our flaps. And uh, so anyway, co-pilot starts it. And this is how we go with it. Anywho's. Oh, this is where our landing gear is. It's down right now. That tells us it's down. Got another cage, but uh, that's because we're at the gate. Oh, that's how we lift it up. This wheel's coming. Number 2601, for direct to you as well. Direct to you as well. Envoy 3792, contact Chicago Center 134.82. This is Billings, Montana. And actually, if you look closely, see the control tower up there for the airport. So yesterday I had a uh, medical emergency on my plane, so I have to fill out a little report for that. And what I'll do is get my company iPad out here on my layover and just fill it out here. So that's the kind of thing. It was a 41-year-old female, uh, low blood pressure, going in and out of consciousness. Doctor and nurse on board took care of her. I declared an emergency, uh, landed, and I had the per uh, medical personnel meet her. Just another day in the life of an airline captain. <laughs> and so I'm watching a little, building some rides and doing some stuff on YouTube. You get a real good bird's eye view of some serious weather coming here. Uh, you can see that pouring down rain. And you see right up there, the poor little airport sits. I just got back from dinner. And uh, oh, safe and sound in my room. All right, here I am, exit row, and on a deadhead. There's my co pilot right there. <laughs> and uh, what we're going to do is we're passengers now. Um, and we're going to fly up to, on the back here, up to San Francisco. And then we're going to pick up our trip from San Fran. We get to board before them. Anyway, that's that's a perk. But uh, we'll talk to you in uh, San Fran. The brakes partially out and fully retracted. This is our descent into San Fran. Back in the driver's seat again. Uh, it's in my deadhead back there. I got called back for an altercation in the back where passenger had assaulted another passenger and so I went back there from my deadhead to help out the flight attendant and uh, got that all straight. Never ends, does it? I think what the NBA would want to do is... Alright, another hotel. And the hard thing about this is you had three different hotels in a week. Got to figure out which direction do I turn when I leave the hotel to get to the elevator. Let's see if that's the right way. Yep. All right. Let's see what we got here. Great room. Nice room. Nice view. Well, guys, I don't know if you can hear, but the music's booming. There's a train. And it is absolutely right out because it's, what, 4 o'clock here? But I have to fly an all-nighter tonight. So I'm going to show you a MacGyver move with... Um, with this most of the time your curtains won't close all the way where it blacks it out so let me show you the MacGyver move and there you have it you take uh, the hangers with the little clips on it clip that close it kind of knocks most of the light out oh. all right in Las Vegas about to fly home on the all-nighter Yo. 
there's my gate. Just a bus. So now I gotta sit here and wait for another bus. Takes forever. Ugh. So that bus goes over there and then goes to the parking lot. So I gotta sit here. I came down the jetway over there. I mean the external stairs and man, this is one of the worst parts of the trip. I'm a little shocked it didn't take but a couple of minutes and here comes the next one. So I'll jump on there to go to my car. Driving home from the all-nighter. Uh, it's 5, 17 in the morning. Still on the airport property. And the good news is this is Memorial Day weekend and it's five in the morning. I'm gonna be the only one on the road going home, hopefully. Sun's not quite up yet. There's the uh, North Tower at O'Hare. These are our hangars coming up here. And time to go just leaving the secure area here and man going through security over there those cops are not nice at all Chicago PD at the airport just what you guys get with them we get the same thing and here's the thing I'm coming out of here right now the employee parking lot and right here at the employee parking lot is a train track and brothers and sisters let me just tell you this it's amazing how many times you get done with your trip and boom those train tracks get you okay, it's green let's see if it gets me on camera here And this is where they switch the train too, so they slow down. Anywho's, I made it. Woohoo! On my way home now. Okay, here's a good thing about the, the all-nighter heading away from the city. I'm the only cat over here. There's one person behind me, but on this highway so far, just me and this other car, so. You take the good with the bad. This is the half full side of it. I'm out on the road by myself, just trucking on along, going on. So if trains don't get me, I should make it home in record time. There are five sets of tracks that I cross. I've been stopped at all five of them. It's always inevitable when I just want to go home, a choo-choo stops me. Moly guys <laughs> sitting at this light heard a big crash turn around that crash just happened so I just left the scene now Wow the day in the life of an airline pilot All right guys I told you I'd tell you about the trim of an airplane and the trim of an airplane is like a front-end alignment on a car But once a car is aligned the front-end alignment is done it is pretty much good to go, but on an airplane, we have to deal with three axes. The pitch ax, uh, axis, which is the nose up and down. The roll axis, which is the wings going left or right. I mean, down or up. And the yaw axis, which is the tail going back and forth. So we deal with all three of those. To make an airplane fly level and not change, wanting to change, we have to do what we call trim. Because the faster you go, the more lift is created over the wings, and the more lift you have means the airplane wants to go up. But we don't want it necessarily to go up when we go faster. So what do we do? We have to trim the airplane. And what that is, is it changes the control surfaces just by a little bit. It changes the neutral position on an airplane so that it will stay like you want it to stay. So for example, if I'm going at a certain airspeed at a certain altitude, um, 
and I get the airplane trimmed, it's going to want to stay at that altitude and uh, that airspeed. Now let's say I change my speed and I slow down, there's less lift on the wings now that I slow down, so it wants to descend. But I don't want to descend, I just want to slow. So what happens is, there are surfaces on the tail. The tail controls the pitch up and down. And so what uh, the trim does is it slightly changes the tail as I slow down to lift the nose just a little bit and that resets it at that speed to fly level. Same thing when you speed up. When you speed up, the airplane wants to go up but I don't want it to go up necessarily so it, the tail, we start trimming the tail. What I mean by trimming is changing the pitch on the tail just to keep the thing flying level. Um, we do have to trim it in the roll axis and the yaw axis but not very often. Typically speaking on the yaw axis is pretty much always set. Uh, if the airplane has been had some G on it and maybe have, uh, a little bit uh, bent or something, then you'll see the yaw axis need to be trimmed. But once it's trimmed though, you usually don't have to change that. Same with the roll axis. So what we deal with most as pilot is the pitch axis. Okay, so that is trim. The uh, Airbus and, and the F-16 they're self-trimming, so as you start slowing down, it knows that you're just slowing down. So it changes the pitch, uh, changes the trim, that is, automatically for you. So you don't have to keep changing your pitch, I mean, changing your trim. Uh, it does it automatically, which is an awesome thing. Before I talk about reverse thrust, let's talk about how a, a jet engine works. It works with suck, squeeze, bang, push, and blow. Uh, air is uh, drawn in through the intake, it is compressed down, fuel is added and it's lit, then that goes across the turbine, brick, uh, turbine blades in the back, and then it blows out the back end and there's where you get your thrust. So uh, the way my engine starts is it uses compressed air from an auxiliary power unit, we call it the APU, and it spins these blades which draws the air in, fuel is added and it's lit, then it goes out of the back as thrust. However, you can see that that's not self-sustaining. So what you do to self-sustain it is you put another, you put turbine blades on the back of it. So as air is drawn in, it's compressed. It's um, at fuel is added. It's lit. Now that expanded gas goes across the turbines, and you can see since it's connected, that turbine now will spin the compressor. So it's self-sustaining and then the rest of the thrust goes out of the back. Well, the engineers find out that if you put a shroud around the jet engine and add more blades to it, it can get uh, way more thrust. As a matter of fact, here's your, your turbine engine in here, your jet engine, and this is high bypass, and 80% of the thrust actually comes from the coal section, which is the um, high bypass section, and uh, it, it's a lower velocity air, so the Low velocity air shrouds the high velocity air, and not only is it more efficient, but it's way quieter. That's what this shields the high velocity air and makes the turbine engines quieter. So reverse thrust, what do we get out of that? Um, I don't have the turbine blades on this one, but actually I don't have the turbine blades on this one. But the what we ha have is the um, part of the engine casing moves back and it blocks the high bypass section and, and actually routes it back forward on the outside of the engine. So 80% now of the thrust goes forward and starts slowing you down where the 20% of the core goes out of the back. So it's still very efficient on how the reverse thrust works. So that's how we do it. All right guys, um, I wanted to spell a couple of myths. Uh, but first, I know the number one question I'm gonna get asked is, can I get you free tickets? The answer is no, don't ask. Well, my grandmother Fanuka Bell just died in Poland. Can you get me free tickets? The answer is no, don't ask. All right. Um, I've been flying for 26 years now and do what my wife and family do. We just go buy tickets, guys. So no, I can't get you free tickets. All right. The, the next thing, the myths. Uh, there's a couple of myths that I hear that just just boggle my mind. Um, uh, I'll get people will come up and say nice landing and I'll say the co-pilot landed and you know what they say is you let him fly? 
Well, yes, that co-pilot is fully qualified on there to fly all by himself. We all have two pilots, um, at least, but yes, everybody is qualified to fly the airplane by themselves. And again, guys, I hear stuff that people say, it just is kind of crazy when you hear it. Uh, here's somebody say, you know, we hit an air pocket and dropped 10,000 feet. No, you didn't. If you did, you would be on CNN. Trust me on this. I've been in what we'd call severe turbulence before, and at the most, a couple of hundred uh, feet is what you'll bounce up and down at. Now, just to put it in perspective, our tail is, you know, 50 feet in the air. So, I mean, th that's on my airplane. So, no, you didn't. The other one is, we went straight up. For how long? The entire flight. No, you didn't. You might have had that perspective, but unless you're in an F-15 or an F-16 or an F-18, you did not go straight up. Also, uh, I'll hear people say, well, there's an airplane right, right there. Why don't you go, <laughs> go fly that airplane? Here's the deal, guys. When you're qualified on an airplane, I'm qualified on the A319 and A320 on the Airbus. I also have type ratings on the 767 and the 757, and I've flown the 737 as commercial airliners. However, you even if you have those things on your pilot's license, you're only qualified at your company to fly one type of airplane. Mine is the Airbus A319 or 320. Um, those are called common type ratings. Um, the 757 and 767 are common type ratings. However, they've got some new variants on it that may not be common. So you're only qualified to fly one specific type of aircraft at an airline. And the only ones that can fly more than that are the test pilots. And uh, you don't want, you know, us going out there and trying to fly airplanes that we are not qualified on. Um, another thing, and this one, there's going to be some absolute nut jobs out there, and this is not for them because they're not going to believe me anyway. But I thought, I thought this was crazy until one of my co-pilots told me this is real, where some people think that we're spraying chemicals out with the contrails. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. Now, I will tell you this. Like I said, for you nut jobs out there, you're not going to believe me anyway. But if you could take your Ford F-150 and get it up at 35,000 feet, you are going to have a contrail if an airplane's leaving contrail. Anytime you burn fossil fuel, there is water vapor in it. And we're flying up there, and even in the summer when it's 120 degrees on the ground, it's typically minus 40 or minus 50 degrees Celsius, Celsius that is, uh, airborne. So yes, if the conditions are right, that water will vaporize and will actually condense and turn into uh, a contrail. Like I said, your F-150, if you take it up there, will leave a contrail. Here's another one I hear that is kind of funny too. People will say, we sat on the runway for three hours. No, you didn't. Sitting on a runway is like sitting on a live train track. The last place in the world a pilot wants to be is on a runway, unless he's going out there to take off immediately or land and then get off. You do not sit on runways. However, you will sit on a taxiway, you'll sit in the parking areas, but no, you did not sit on a runway for three hours. <laughs> All right, another thing that Hollywood loves to do is when, <laughs> when a pilot has an emergency, is the first thing they do is get on the radio and they start talking to the air traffic controller and the air traffic controller talks them down. That's a huge myth. Air traffic controllers are not pilots. They're, they're getting their pilot's licenses recently, but they're, they're not airline pilots. They're, if they have their pilot's license, it's not a commercial license, it's just on a little light airplane. What the, it just seems cool to talk on the radio and start screaming. Guys, let me tell you what we say in the aviation in, industry. Aviate, navigate, communicate. So the first one we're going to do, if we have an emergency, is fix the airplane. The air traffic controller can't help me, okay? So we're going to fix the airplane first. Once we get ourselves together, if it's something that's dire, uh, once we get ourselves together, we're going to tell the air traffic controller where we're going to go and land. And... Uh, that's about all the air traffic controller is going to do. Clear other airplanes out of our way, and uh, we're going to tell them where we're going to go and get us set up for the landing. What I mean by that is clear everybody out of our way so we can land and not have conflicts with other airplanes. Um, balloons. You guys letting these balloons go? 
Man, I have seen balloons up at 35,000 feet, and they go whizzing by at 500 miles an hour. Scares me to death. So every time you let a balloon go, especially those Mylar ones, just know you're probably going to scare the dickens out of, a, out of an airline pilot. Um, what else was there? Uh, taxiing. Why do you have to have your seatbelts on? It's just the FAA law, guys. We don't make those laws. The FAA does. You have to have your seatbelts on for taxiing. Yes, you can stand up in a bus and all that. I understand that and not have a seatbelt sign on. But if you're in an airplane and you're taxiing, you have to have your seatbelt on. Okay, weather, guys. We deal with three types of weather when you're in this business. Uh, the departure weather, which you guys see. Then we deal with en route weather, which you don't see, and the destination weather, which you don't see. Now, a lot of times people will say, I don't understand why there's a weather delay and it's sunny. And, and, and Guys, listen. There are other weather things we deal with. And most of the times when it's weather, it is not us. It's the air traffic controllers. And what they're doing is there are lanes in the sky just like there are lanes on a highway. You can't, you got to have the airplane spaced a certain distance apart. And when you have a big old thunderstorm in a way, it cuts down some of the lanes. And because of that, they have to funnel guys into other lanes to bring you into an airport. Because of that and the spacing, they can't let too many airplanes take off because you get them all bunched up and they can't be like that. And it's also at the destination, um, the weather there. If the weather is, once the weather gets to a certain sp a spot, if they typically space an airplane, you know, 10 miles apart, now they have to go 20, so they can't bring as many airplanes in. So uh, when you see that sunny weather and they tell you a weather delay, guys, don't forget that there's en route weather and there is destination weather. Okay, what's a deadhead? A deadhead is a leg that a pilot is flown in the back of an airplane in order to get him to where he is going. Uh, it's not anything to do with the Grateful Dead, but we call it deadheading on a leg that you're in the back and the company is moving you. There's also jump seating and pass riding, which pilots can do, and you see those in uniform sitting in the back. But a guy who is deadheading, just like you saw in this video, when my co-pilot and I were deadheading to San Francisco, we're on tickets, dudes. We're on positive space tickets to get us to fly another leg. Um, those seats um, are, we're ticketed, we're, um, we're passengers. Uh, however, some of our rules for the time that we can fly is they, it still applies. Open gates. Um, you're here, guys. Uh, there's a, we're waiting to go to a gate, and they'll say, well, that's an open gate. Well, that's something way beyond my control. That's something that, uh, that somebody higher up does. You might see an open gate, but they got a guy that just landed, and he came in from Berlin, and he's going to that gate, and therefore you can't have it because your gate's over there, and they're waiting for somebody to push. So, yes, it looks very simple from the outside looking in, saying, hey, go get that gate. But it's just not that simple, guys. We don't want to be sitting out there no more than you do. Okay, <laughs> your day being ruined, my day's being ruined too because anytime there's a disruption, my schedule changes and normally it's not to the better. Well guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. Just to let you know, the reason I made this video is because of jealousy, <laughs> to be honest with you. I see guys doing the hobbies that I do and they're so incredible with the hobbies and then they take you to work and they're just incredible with their jobs. I'm not incredible with my hobby. But with my job, I definitely know what I'm doing. So I wanted to show that uh, I'm not incompetent in all things. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video. Um, I hope you learned a little bit more about the industry. And uh, I hope to be doing this soon, uh, more of this kind of videos. But anyway, thank you very much for watching.